This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. West African leaders plan extraordinary talks on Monday to end Mali crisis. Egyptians concerned over growing scarcity of water as Nile Dam hits first filling target. And coronavirus cases sharply increase in Africa as the continent records over 810,000 COVID-19 infections. Hello and a very warm welcome to you wherever you're joining us. This is Africa Live here on CGTN with me, Mahia Mutwa in Nairobi. Also coming up. In business, the Egyptian parliament approves a new law to stabilize the banking sector. And in sports, lack of funding for the Ethiopian Premier League due to COVID-19 concerns, analysts and fans. We begin the hour in West Africa, where the region's leaders will hold a virtual summit on Monday. The meeting is expected to propose measures to end the deepening political crisis in the country. It comes after five heads of state from the region met with the government and the opposition in the country's capital city, Bamako, on Thursday. The leaders are worried the political stalemate in Mali could undermine a regional fight against Islamist militants. Tens of thousands of Malians have taken to the streets in recent weeks, sparking clashes with police. Mali's main opposition group, M5RFP, says it will not quit until President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita steps down, raising concerns in neighboring countries of a protracted crisis. In all these meetings, the objective is to find a compromise which will allow Mali to get out of this crisis quickly. I am optimistic. I hope that a solution will be found, but we have decided to report back to all the heads of states of ECOWAS during an extraordinary summit that will be held on Monday, July 27. Meanwhile, leaders from the economic community of West African states have been trying to avert a deepening crisis in Mali, from Abuja, our correspondent Phil Ihaza takes a look at previous mediation efforts by ECOWAS. Since early June, demonstrators have been protesting against disrupted elections, increasing insecurity and poor governance. Although Malian President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita has dissolved the constitutional court to pave way for a fresh election, many of the protesters still want him out. An ECOWAS mediation team led by an address from a president, Good Luck Jonathan, was unsuccessful in negotiating for peace after opposition groups rejected a plan to form a unity government. I would suggest that the leaders of ECOWAS should put on the table a comprehensive blueprint and roadmap towards revitalizing the Malian states. They have to be empowered to choose democratically, freely and fairly, leaders of their own choice and so that they can now have the power to punish or reward accordingly in every election cycle, good or bad governance. And that should be the best antidote to responsible leadership in Mali. ECOWAS has a long history of mediating in Mali. Its efforts contributed to the return of democracy to the country in 2013. And now, five West African leaders, including Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari and the President of Niger, who is also the chairman of the ECOWAS bloc, Muhammadu Isufu, are in Mali to once again try to broker peace. ECOWAS says removing President Keita from office is not something it can endorse, as the president was democratically elected in 2013 and re-elected five years later. But experts say the option of a voluntary resignation needs to be considered, especially as calls for him to leave grow more popular. His voluntary resignation, voluntary stepping, up, stepping down, will not be unconstitutional. It will still be in line with the constitution. So that option has to be explored. He's 75 years old. I do not think a 75 year old man would want his country to collapse by his own head. So he can sacrifice his powers and privileges as a president to allow for lasting peace. And so for me, that is the way to go. If the opposition does not accept anything short of his living power, 
then he should leave. These recent political tensions have created further unrest in a country already battling a range of insurgent groups. According to the United Nations, over 4,000 people have been killed in the last year alone from terrorist attacks in Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso. The hope is that efforts by the leaders of the ECOWAS nations restore peace and stability in Mali as soon as possible to prevent insurgents from taking advantage of the growing unrest there and wrecking havoc in the state. Experts say the implications of not finding a solution to the ongoing crisis could affect the peace in the West African region and beyond. Phil Ihaza, CGTN, Abuja. In Egypt's countryside, access to water remains a challenge. And as Ethiopia begins filling its Grand Renaissance Dam, concerns over water scarcity are growing. Egypt is worried the giant hydroelectric dam upstream could cut into its supply of water from the River Nile. And as Adel Mahrui reports, Egypt's farmers are among the most worried. El Zegazi governorship has some of the most fertile lands in Egypt. Here in Mitabo Ali village, farmers consider themselves luckier than most others in the country. They're very close to the Nile, yet access to its waters is a challenge. We don't have drinking water at home. We struggle every day to get it. We buy it. A gallon could cost up to two dollars. That's a lot of money. And we could wait a week for the drinking water to come. Without water, we can't eat or drink. Most people in rural Egypt work in agriculture. So to them, water is how they make a living. It's why many here are concerned about the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam. Irrigation water is not always available, more so in the dry season in winter. There are channels that distribute the water to different areas in town. We've been learning techniques with different crops to consume less water because of the dam. With any further cut in water, we will starve. All Egyptians will. Water is no joke. When there is no Nile water, we have to use ground pumps, but the water quality is poor and it could take up to 10 hours to water the land, which costs more in gasoline and pumps rent. It takes just two hours to irrigate from the Nile branches. Everything in this part of the country revolves around water. While most international affairs would be of little interest to residents here, Almost all are following the news about the Nile Dam talks. We are very concerned about the Renaissance Dam. We did not reach any solution, but I see Ethiopia proceeding with the building and filling of the dam. There is no doubt it will have an effect on both irrigation and drinking water. Water here is already not enough. Without water, there is no life. The leaders of the three countries must find a solution. Through the AU, the Security Council, I don't care how. We need one. Almost all of Egypt's fresh water comes from the Nile. But its share of 55.5 billion cubic meters still does not cover domestic need. With desalination, recycling and groundwater, the nation reaches 70 billion cubic meters every year. It still needs some additional 20 billion to cover its annual demand for water. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Sharqiyya, Egypt. On to the United States now, where the Chinese Consul General of Houston, Texas, has described the shuttering of his consulate as sabotage. In an open letter, Kai Wei called the closure political provocation. But he says he believes friendship between the Chinese and American people will prevail despite what he calls the deliberate escalation of tensions by a few Americans. Kai Wei wrote cooperation would benefit both countries, adding that the consulate general has always stood with the people in the region, particularly during difficult times like natural disasters and the current pandemic. Kai says he will continue to support China-U.S. cooperation no matter where he is. He also says exchanges between the Chinese government and the southern region of the United States will not stop neither will services to overseas Chinese citizens. He says the Chinese embassy in Washington will make proper arrangements for friendly cooperation and consular services. You. 
Staying in Houston, a group of men have been seen forcing open a door at the Chinese consulate shortly after a U.S. order to close the mission took effect on Friday afternoon. Earlier this week, Washington gave consulate staff 72 hours to vacate the building. Some of the groups seen opening the door reportedly included U.S. State Department officials. This comes as Beijing retaliated by ordering the closure of the U.S. consulate in Chengdu. Well, earlier our reporter Ma Ke was in front of the U.S. consulate in Chengdu. She told us what she's seen there. Right now outside the compound of the U.S. Consulate General in southwestern Chinese city of Chengdu in Sichuan province. And today we are seeing much more activities than yesterday uh, surrounding and uh, inside and outside the compound. Just roughly an hour ago, uh, on my right hand is the small road on the side of the compound. And we saw two trucks of a Chinese moving company uh, driving onto this small road. Uh, they parked there for a few minutes and uh, then turned left into the parking lot of the compound. We also seen some uh, local police officers coming outside the compound and help and help uh, a foreign uh, police, uh, help foreign employees to care uh, to with the moving process. That's before we see some uh, foreign employees uh, coming and going on uh, through the side door of at the front gate of the compound. They were seen carrying some wooden boxes and uh, luggages. Well, this recent activities comes uh, roughly 27 hours after the Chinese side announced the demand of the U.S. side to uh, close its uh, consulate general in Chengdu. The Chinese foreign ministry said this is a legitimate and necessary reaction to the recent U.S. and I quote provocation, which was referring to the closing of the Chinese consulate in the city of Houston. And you may also see there are many police officers standing guard on the street before the consulate general. Local police officers are bringing in more enforcement uh, to maintain order and security at the scene. We've checked with authority and they confirmed that this is more, much more manpower uh, than usual time. We're still trying to keep in touch with the diplomats who work inside the Consulate General, including Council General uh, Jim Mullinax, but so far we haven't got any official response. We will give you some updates when we have them. While the Trump administration cited national security and American intellectual property to justify shutting down the Chinese consulate in Houston. Wang Guan explains why he thinks this is all just plain politics for Donald Trump. Let's face it, Washington's decision to close the Chinese consulate in Houston, Texas will go down in history as the milestone event in the Trump administration's new Cold War on China. Washington's arguments for closing the consulate sounded bizarre and far-fetched. On July 21st, the U.S. State Department said it did so to, quote, protect American intellectual property and Americans' private information without giving details. And on July 22nd, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said that the U.S. did it. To protect the American people, protect our security, our national security, and also protect our economy and jobs. Uh, that's the actions that you're seeing taken by President Trump. We'll continue to engage in that. But with all due respect, Mr. Secretary, many don't understand how expelling some 60 Chinese diplomats and their families, whose mission for the most part is to look after consular and commercial interests of their own citizens, would protect the U.S. security, economy, and jobs. The explanation given by David Stilwell, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia, is at least more substantive. Stilwell said the U.S. closed the Houston Consulate of China because it had a history of engaging in, quote, subversive behavior with recent attempts of, quote, scientific thefts, which could be related to efforts to develop a vaccine for the coronavirus. Again, no evidence is provided, the lack of which raised more questions than answers. While the U.S. tripled its COVID-19 cases in the past two months, China has kept its outbreak largely under control for months. It is a bit difficult to imagine Chinese diplomats risking it all to, quote, steal vaccines on American soil. Perhaps one true reason the Trump administration did not and could not say was Trump's re-election and his base. According to Real Clear Politics, Biden is leading Trump in all major polls. Even in the swing states that helped Trump win in 2016, Biden is leading. To salvage Trump's re-election campaign, top Republican leaders recently told Foreign Policy magazine that party polling consistently reveals that China bashing is immensely popular among Trump supporters and that the Blame China theme can help re-elect the president in November, offsetting some of the disdain many Americans have for his handling of the country's COVID-19 crisis. 
This Pew survey showed that 72% of Republicans have negative views toward China, most of whom probably wouldn't mind seeing Trump getting tougher with Beijing. Even BBC commented on the consulate incident by saying, quote, in the midst of a presidential re-election campaign and with the U.S. economy and society battered by the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Trump has determined that there is political advantage in playing the China card. While Trump is mostly concerned with elections, people around him took advantage of that to push their own agendas. The intelligence community and military security establishment have long sought to contain a rising China and prevent Beijing from becoming a superior economic, military, and technological power. Liberals on the left, who long took issue with China's human rights record and its lack of commitment to Western-style democracy, joined the action. It is appalling that Chinese diplomats became sacrificial lambs in this politically charged season. It is even more upsetting that U.S.-China relations are now held hostage by a small group of politicians to advance their own political interests against the wishes of most people on both sides who are just sick and tired of this endless tit-for-tat. Let's take you back to Ethiopia now, where the country's government estimates that 15 million of its citizens have no access to electricity. Most of these are farmers or people living in rural areas. The Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is projected to generate 6,450 megawatts of hydropower, and that could help electrify rural Ethiopia. CGTN's Girum Chala with more. A scene that represents most of rural Ethiopia during the rainy season, with green and fertile lands everywhere. But on the other side, there is poor infrastructure and not enough clean water. According to the World Bank, for roughly half of the population, there is also no access to electricity. That is, despite nearly 80% of the population living within proximity of medium voltage transmission lines. Shiburu Kumsa is a farmer on the outskirts of the capital, Addis Ababa. In this rainy season, subsistence farmers like Shiburu spend most of their days working in their fields. After work, he returns home to his family. His house, just like all of his neighbors, have no power. The problem of electricity is simply unbearable. There is no light in our village, and we only use candles and lanterns to light up our houses and also for our kids to study at night. The lack of access to electricity has left us way behind most people in urban settings. For Shibiru, the provision of electricity could change just about everything access to new farming technology and information through TV or mobile phone become options when there is electricity. That is in turn could help him increase output, sell at higher prices, and above all, make his and his family's life easier than ever before. Hydropower generated from the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam could help this become a reality. As far as I'm concerned, the completion of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam means all Ethiopians will be able to access electricity in our respective homes, the equal rebirth for us. Also, above and beyond the completion of the dam, it's good news for the rest of Africa as it can serve an African development purpose. Other farmers share similar thoughts. The Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam has a lot of meaning for all Ethiopians. The future holds a lot of good promises for all of us due to this great dam. We believe with it comes electricity and even other technologies. Ethiopia is building this four-plus billion dollars dam on the Nile. The scheduled completion of the project is for 2022. The dam is the centerpiece of Ethiopia's bid to become Africa's biggest power exporter and through a government bond selling scheme as people like Shibiru who are helping to finance it. 
For us to come out of darkness, we have been giving any support we can. We have been buying bonds as financial contribution for the construction of the dam. And now more than ever, we are behind our government so that they can finish the job on time. We hope to see the day we change our candles and lanterns with proper electricity. We have bought the dam's bonds several times before, and we shall continue rallying behind the dam for the future to unroll we see the intended results. We need technology and factories around here so we can see our lives change sooner. The dam holds the key for that. The Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is now close to 80% complete. The first round of filling the dam's reservoir with 4.9 billion cubic meters of water has also been completed ahead of time. Many say all of these success have brought the dreams of millions of Ethiopians close to a concrete reality. Grumtara CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. It's time for us to take a short break here on Africa Live. Stay with us. Here's what's coming up. Coronavirus cases sharply increase in Africa as the continent records over 810,000 cases. And Africans share mixed feelings over the use of face masks in preventing the spread of COVID-19. My family has been doing this hard work for the past 600 years. dream is to be the reading player in, in, in Africa in the spice sector. Nobody in the region consumes it. Even me cannot afford the vanilla cooking. created here is the elegance, the color, the celebration of life. Welcome back. You're watching Africa Live. Now the number of COVID-19 cases continues to rise across the continent. The continent has recorded over 800,000 cases. Africa's death toll continues to stay relatively low at over 17,000. So far, over 462,000 COVID-19 patients have recovered from the virus in Africa. South Africa continues to report the highest number of cases on the continent, with over 400,000 cases recorded. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, the federal government has instructed civil servants to undergo testing. Now, masks have rapidly joined the list of don't leave home without them items for hundreds of millions across Africa. But the debate over their effectiveness continues. Not everyone is okay with covering their airways, with those living in extreme poverty saying they are an, an unaffordable luxury. The World Health Organization supports the wearing of face masks, saying it helps to limit the spread of COVID-19. Many African governments have heeded this call. You are wearing a mask, mask, mask is very important, especially this winter season. You see people, they've got a flu. Sometimes you're in a taxi, you're seated next to a person, you don't have mask, someone can just sneeze. So it's very dangerous and the corona will be at high risk. Countries like South Africa and Nigeria have made it mandatory to wear a mask in public. But many people don't believe masks play that big of a role in stemming the spread of the coronavirus. It's not the mask that is protecting us, is it? Like, um, with the way the whole thing is, like if you check the market and everywhere, we cannot say that there's something in this town that is like killing people and the whole place is cooked, crowded like this. And some have only adapted to the discomfort of masking their airways for the benefit of others. If I see a person who is not wearing a mask, I'll just say, put on your mask to prevent corona, but which is, I don't know whether it is there or no. To tell the truth, I don't know. 
but I'll just say put on your mask to prevent this disease for both of us to be safe. But while face masks are becoming a must-have, it's still very common to see people misusing them or using disposable ones for long periods of time. But with COVID-19 still here, some say the mask has become a mirror on humanity. It will also continue to be part of the daily commercial hustle. Chao Mohono, CGTN. Now, while citizens share mixed feelings when it comes to wearing face masks, more and more scientists are highlighting their importance. CGTN's Daniel Arapmoy spoke with Dr. Joachim Oser from the African Medical and Research Foundation on the role of face masks in the fight against COVID-19. There is still a robust scientific divide on whether masks are effective. Why is this so? I think it's important to realize that COVID is a new disease, and so research is going on, and each day there will be something new that we discover about the disease. That is why in the beginning, uh, WHO issued guidelines which did not include the use of masks. But in due course, a lot more research has been done that shows that masks may be important. Uh, so being a new disease and with emerging information every time, you expect uh, a bit of conflicting information, you expect uh, people to get confused and there is a lot of fear around the disease. Uh, I think that's where we are with the issue of masks. Doctor, what kind of masks should be worn? Masks should depend on the type of um, work someone does. For the general public, uh, even cloth masks can still be used. They prevent the spill of saliva, mucus, body fluid from people's mouth into the environment. Where in particular should masks be worn? So if you are in an environment where people are breathing and you, you like to breathe or stare the air they are breathing into, then you need the masks. And that means a place, a public place where there are many people breathing closely or uh, where uh, you are more than one person, basically, but not in your house. If you are in your house alone, you need a mask because the air you are breathing is you alone and maybe the people who are. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your time and uh, have a good one. Now, a surge in reported teenage pregnancies in Kenya is threatening to cut short the pursuit of education for vulnerable girls. This surge comes as schools have closed their doors due to the COVID-19 pandemic. While the government has disputed the numbers, it acknowledges that without the relative safety of schools, teenage girls in the country are at risk. CGTN's Wilkista Nyabwa has more. Each person picks one or two, holding the garments against their bodies to see if the clothes will fit. The pile of clothes will be shared among residents in this low-income neighborhood in Kenya's capital. This is one of the projects initiated by the Nairobi-based group Ngarum Tani, which loosely means to look good in the neighborhood. The community-based organization collects and distributes used clothes to those in need. I used to see my neighbors going with the torn clothes, and then I, I said that, Let me, what can I do? He appealed to anyone with clothes to spare to donate them. But the organization's mandate is more than just to clothe those in need. As members saw through the pile, they also discussed the problems plaguing them. One of these thorny topics is teen pregnancy. And right now, you see, these boys and girls are at home. Uh, Everybody is at home, and the parents are not at home. Parents are working. Under that open chance, girls are really, uh, are really being convinced. In June, Machakos, one of Kenya's 47 counties, reported that almost 4,000 adolescent girls had visited health facilities for antenatal services in the county between January and May. This came just after the National Council for Population and Development in Kenya warned that approximately one in every five Kenyan teenage girls had either had a live birth or was pregnant. And since the pandemic hit, there's concern that these numbers could rise. School helps because it keeps the girls busy all day. 
But now with the coronavirus, the girls are idle and at home all day. Girls are very fragile and uh, in our community, we, come, we stay in, a, in, in the slums, we stay as neighbors. And this, we are not staying in a closed uh, area. We are, we are just living in an open area where everybody can indulge with anyone. Teenage pregnancy in Kenya is driven by a number of factors, including the lack of education on sexual and reproductive health, poverty, early sexual initiation, harmful cultural practices such as child marriages, and sexual abuse or violence. Being at home for the better part of the year also puts the girls at a higher risk of unplanned pregnancies. Our children are tired of staying indoors. They want to go out and meet their friends, boys and girls alike. It's challenging. Kenya's Ministry of Health argues that the number of pregnant teens isn't as high as initially reported in Machakos. In a statement, the ministry said the numbers were inflated and inaccurately extrapolated from the number of antenatal visits by teenage mothers. However, the government agrees that teenage girls are at risk. I am indeed concerned by the increased tensions within our homes. Cases of gender-based violence have increased, mental health issues worsened, and instances of teenage pregnancy have also escalated. In the face of these concerns, President Uhuru Kenyatta has warned that those responsible for impregnating minors will face the full force of the law. Across the country, stakeholders continue to work to keep girls safe, and in their own small way, organizations such as Mngarom Tani are providing safe spaces in the absence of school, places where girls can gather and talk as they dream of brighter futures after the pandemic. Wilke Sanyabwa Sijitian. The WHO reported a record rise in new coronavirus cases on Friday. Infections shot up by over 280,000 in 24 hours, while the death toll rose by more than 9,000. It is the biggest daily increase since the end of April. Total cases worldwide are now over 15 million. Nearly 640,000 people have died. Deaths worldwide now average at 5,000 a day, up from a daily average of 4,600 last month. Most of the world's cases are in the, are in the United States, Brazil, India, Russia, and South Africa. Now, with daily confirmed COVID-19 cases of over 1,000 in France, authorities are considering new measures such as compulsory mask wearing, wider scale testing, and even border controls to curb the spike in infections. Stefan de Vries has more. In the fashion capital of the world, the protective face mask is this summer's unmissable accessory. Now the number of confirmed infections with COVID-19 is increasing again. There is growing fear of a second wave. There are now about a thousand new cases a day, a quarter more than last week. Yet there are significant regional differences. Especially in the northeast of the country, in Brittany and on the Atlantic South Coast, popular regions with holidaymakers, the number of infections is increasing. During the summer holiday, it seems that the French have become too complacent about hygiene measures. The authorities are pressing the citizens to follow all guidelines. There are dispensers with hydroalcoholic gel everywhere, and in shops, public buildings and on public transport, masks are obligatory. In general, the measures are widely accepted. It's a sacrifice we make for society. We have our own personal freedom, but we live in a society, so we should think of others, not just about ourselves. Samples of wastewater from the Paris sewage system have been showing traces of COVID-19 again since the end of June. These had disappeared when France imposed a lockdown. On Friday, President Macron convened the National Security Council to see if new measures are necessary. These could include new border controls, expanding testing and a broader obligation to wear face masks. Stefan de Vries for CGTN, Paris. And it's time for the business headlines here on Africa Live. Here's what's coming up. Egyptian parliament approves new law to stabilize banking sector. 
and Tunisia government to implement measures aimed at bolstering economic recovery. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Let's start the business in Egypt where the country's parliament has approved a new law that will enhance stability and governance in the banking sector. The legislation will give the Central Bank of Egypt more oversight over the financial sector, allowing it to introduce measures governing cryptocurrencies, fintech and electronic payments. CGTN's Adel Mahrui with that report. Egypt is redefining its governance over the banking sector. The new Banking Act gives the Central Bank of Egypt the right to issue licenses for credit risk guarantee companies, to provide short-term bailout funds for struggling banks, and set its own regulations to govern financial technologies and cryptocurrencies. The North African nation's parliament rejected to give the Administrative Prosecution Authority rights to investigate CBE officials. The House also refused the Egyptian Competition Authority to monitor the banking sector, leaving the CBE as the sole untouched banking regulator in the country. The law is implementing the constitution articles that maintains the independence of the Central Bank of Egypt. It empowers its governance and stands against fraud and monopoly practices. Overall, the law gives more powers to the CBE. It will have more authority over the banking industry. It will improve many aspects. It could also have some downsides which will emerge after it gets implemented, especially the COVID-19 impact on the economy. The new legislation authorizes a 1% tithe on bank profits to finance an industrial development fund. It sets stricter measures to protect clients' privacy and information. Once signed into a law, it will allow the government to introduce new debt instruments beyond bonds and bills. Capital required for foreign exchange companies has been cut in half, while harsher punishment has been imposed for black market violations. The law deals with numerous banking aspects. We have suffered in the past years and we need to expand our financial inclusion program. We need to develop the banking infrastructure. The law will help in the technological development that we need. If the law is applied properly, it will lead to the development of the banking and financial sectors. The new banking law gives the Prime Minister the right to appoint the chairman and board members of state-owned banks. They will be subject to competency approval from the Central Bank of Egypt. Despite its ultimate power, the CBE didn't win the entire legislative battle. Parliament has scrapped term limits on board members and managing directors for banks. The House has also enforced a grievances committee to appeal against the CBE's decisions and penalties. Once the act is signed in a law, banks will have up to three years to comply with the new regulations. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. The Tunisian government says it's facing a severe economic crisis worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic. The country has now put in place several financial, fiscal and social measures that will be implemented over the next nine months. Here is CGTN's Adnan Shawashi with more details. Tunisia's finance minister said that the new measures are necessary in order to mitigate the negative impact of the coronavirus crisis on the country's fragile economy. These important measures include eight essential additional chapters relating to boosting investment, improving the business climate, supporting startups and innovative projects, in addition to strengthening the social aspect by supporting low income groups. Yaish added that the state will provide the financial, human, and logistical needs to implement the set of measures within a period of six to nine months. These measures also aim to fight poverty, modernize tax administration, digitize procedures, streamline financial transactions in cash, and integrate parallel activities into the economic circuit, in addition to fighting tax evasion, modernizing customs, and strengthening control. 
The Parliamentary Finance Commission approved the government's structural reform plan. Experts assert that Tunisia must reduce state expenses and the public sector wage bill in the next 18 months. In particular, there will be no recruitment in the civil service in 2020 and 2021. The economic situation is very difficult. It's unprecedented. The government is looking for additional resources to finance the state budget until the end of the current year. In the meantime, it's unacceptable to pay the salaries of over 800,000 civil servants while the economy is at its lowest level. The Ministry of Finance has created the Tunisian Fund of Funds and boosted it with around 600 million dinars, which is more than $200 million, to finance startups. Authorities will also boost public-private partnership and regional development projects. Tunisian Prime Minister Lesel Farfer announced that the new economic and social measures aim to increase growth and create wealth and investment by encouraging entrepreneurs in the private sector and improving the business climate. The state will also support strategic sectors, especially tourism and agriculture. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Elsewhere in South Africa, a new drone manufacturing facility is set to open in Cape Town. It will construct the country's first locally designed, fully waterproof, multi-role drone. CGTN's Travis Andrews has the details. It's called the Gannet Pro. And like many drones, it's capable of many useful aerial applications. But unlike many others, this one is fully amphibious. It's capable of going where no other can, including through waterfalls and even under the sea, which has made it a particularly useful tool for recreational fishing, search and rescue, the medical industry, and even life-saving. What makes this one unique is that it's designed from the ground up with water in mind found a way to make these drones waterproof. We've patented that in multiple countries. We've rolled it out and this is the first look at our drone. Like almost a year later, we've got our final production copy in front of us. This is all injection molded and really next level. We've got dealers signed up all over the world. The manufacturer will develop two models, with one being built at a facility in China and one set to be built at a new facility being set up in Cape Town. The employers will work in constructing the machine's unique features, which according to the company includes the world's first patented dual payload release system. Also on board is a unique flight bladder with zero permeability and a 2 kilogram payload capability that will make fishing a lot more interesting. Orders have come in from all over the world and that sets the foundation for the manufacturing facility, which will be built here in the Waverley Business District and initially employ more than 20 people. It really is a refined product. It is expensive to make. It is complicated to make. We have decided that we actually want a, our own version of this that we are going to build here in South Africa. We want to bring an affordable drone to the market, um, something that's under the 10,000 Rand mark. And we are going to be shipping these in shawls and parts, having local jobs, building as many of these drones as we can. For now though, this eye in the sky will soon take to the skies across the world and it could be just the start of many more locally made drones on the horizon. Travis Andrews, CGTN, Cape Town. Taking you to news just reaching us, Somalia's members of parliament have passed a vote of no confidence against the Prime Minister Hassan Ali Khaire and his cabinet. 170 Somali members of parliament have voted to ouster the Prime Minister and his government. The polls have allegedly triggered chaos in Parliament as some MPs are against the move. The decision is likely to trigger the beginning of a political crisis in the Horn of Africa nation. Well, it's time for us to take another short break. Here's what's coming up. In our continuing series, Tribes in a Flux, we take a closer look at the Berber tribes in North Africa and their traditional woven rugs. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? 
If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. Now, people are the link to culture and tradition. In Morocco, where members of the Berber tribe live, a big part of the local culture is exemplified by the intricately woven rugs. This trade has been passed down through several generations. Today's Tribes in a Flux series explores the question of just how long this unique Berber tradition can survive. كان <تصفيق> سير تربية ديال الدار معروفة تمشي تحطب معروفة تمشي تحلب البهيم تمشي تدير تمشي تفعل يعني كيت لك إلا ما كناش المرأة القروية راه ما كان والو قاريين ما واعين ما والو هاد الشي من الجيل بالأجداد ما غاديش نلقاو دابا هاداك الشي ديال الأجداد مش راه بقى لينا غير شوية مهم الثقافة ديالهم حنا هاداك الجلابة كنلبسوهم رجال And coming up in the sports. 
Lack of funding for the Ethiopian Premier League due to COVID-19 concerns, analysts and fans. How would you create your legend? On the fields. On the tracks. In the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene. Find. Let's kick things off in Addis Ababa, where analysts and fans are concerned that the Ethiopian Premier League could be scrapped altogether due to the coronavirus crisis. The 16-team league depends on government funding and with COVID-19 forcing Ethiopia to readjust its budget towards health care, it is unclear if the government will be keen to finance football. CGTN's Coletta Anjohi spoke to Mensur Abdul Keni a sports analyst who began by explaining that over-dependence on the government remains a weakness for the sport. Without the government funding, the Ethiopian Premier League cannot be survive at all. Most of the clubs, over 95% of the clubs in the Ethiopian league structure are owned by the government. So the state funding is very important. Only, you know, some two, three clubs are now, they are, uh, uh, they are, they are operating without the government funding. So if the states uh, unplug the, the funding, then the clubs, you know, uh, uh, they will not, uh, not just struggling, but also it's uh, very difficult to survive at all. Is there any way that uh, these football clubs can be able to move away from our dependence on government funding and government um, support and, and try and stand on themselves like we're seeing in other countries? The situation is not ready for them to, to collect uh, um, much more income. They're, you know, you should have uh, TV income, broadcasting rights. There is no broadcasting rights in Ethiopian football. The gate income is Vinal clubs and Addisawa clubs. They are selling their merchandises. But it's not enough to cover the, their annual budget. So. They are far away just uh, to, uh, to cover it, you know. There must be some, uh, you know, professional plan from the, from the clubs, from the national federation to lead them uh, to that professional uh, uh, situation. And that's very difficult for the time being, you know. You know, I can say that they are semi-professionals and very near to their... To, 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 uh, very near to uh, amateur level. Are we expecting the Ethiopia football game to recover and maybe come back even much more stronger uh, post this COVID-19 pandemic? This pandemic will have uh, a very huge negative con consequence on Ethiopian football in terms of finance, in terms of um, uh, the fitness of the players, in terms of team performance, in terms of um, uh, this uh, international competitions, they have to think about the future now. They have to have uh, some plans, plan B, plan C, plan C, uh, based on the circumstances, based on the scenarios of, uh, we, of the post-pandemic situation. But they are now waiting for the government's green light to do anything. They are yet to start any, anything, they doing anything for the solution. Turning to European football, Liverpool's Premier League title winning captain Jordan Henderson was named England's football.